Thank you very much. Um, I must admit, I do have a past as an uh, <clears throat> election scholar, although you will not see much of it today. Uh, I have no PowerPoint pre presentation. I have no data. I've taken the liberty <laughs> of, of um, looking at a couple of areas that could be beneficial for us <clears throat> as, as practitioner. Because over the last 15 years, I've been working primarily as an, uh, as an advisor to election commission or being a, an, ad, an election administrator myself, uh, sometimes for the UN, sometimes for the, uh, for the OC. And it's been really interesting to hear some of the discussions here today when someone is mentioning, oh, I noticed in the, in the results tabulation that they just basically tweaked it and they got away with it. In, in some of the countries where I operate, that could result in, in, in uh, well, what? El Clit uh, experience in, in, in Kenya with 1,000 people getting killed and 400,000 being displaced. Uh, things that an election authority would get away with in the West would be unacceptable in, in some of the countries that we do um, operate in. And when it comes to the, the, the cost of elections that was discussed earlier by, by I think it was Alistair, uh, about registration being uh, a, a very important component. We've had for instance, coming back to Afghanistan, four elections now, we spend probably 400 to $450 million on the voter register. We yet to have a voter register. International community were in charge of designing the original model back in 2003, uh, costed about $150 million, failed to deliver a voter register. Since then, we've just been topping up on a non-usable um, model. And, and uh, as the commissioner in 2005, I was partially to, to, to blame on that. But that was sort of the political pressure. You needed to do something. And then suddenly, international community can find money to do things that not a local authority would ever get away with. <clears throat> but where do we stand uh, when it comes to combating electoral fraud from the EMB side, as well as us as technical uh, assistance providers. Unfortunately, we haven't come very far. Really, we haven't come much at all. And I think it's amazing that over so many years of decades that we've been working on elections that we do not have a structured way of trying to analyze the problem. Within the EMBs, a lot of the problems rest with the fact that there's not really sometimes the political will to tackle the fraud challenge. In other cases, it might be that they're so overwhelmed with the sheer logistics of organizing elections that they don't really have time to look at the, the fraud or malpractice issue. And from us as service providers, we usually arrive maybe a year, maybe two years before an election and supposed to be advising them how to make a better process. It's very difficult to start the relationship by telling them how poorly they performed in the most previous election. That's usually not a great confidence building mechanism. So therefore, what we tend to do, we give them a standard package. Indelible ink for multiple voting, uh, uh, safety security seals on a ballot box, tamper evident backs to make sure that the Results forms are not manipulated in transportation from polling stations to, to the tabulation centers. But we need to be more honest. We need to be better. The people deserve for us to be better. And since we didn't really know this much about it, I figured let's look at a couple of other industries that have a history when it comes to anti-corruption and it comes to fraud. I picked two cases. One is the uh, insurance industry, which is notorious when it comes to being challenged with fraud and trying really to prevent this. I also looked at, uh, uh, the, since I'm Swedish, I picked SIDA, the Swedish International Development Authority that prides itself of being excellent when it comes to doing anti-corruption work, as well as reducing its internal problems when it comes to fraud and irregularities. I figured maybe there's something we can learn from these industries in order to jumpstart our work. Yes, we at IFAS have started to do something when it comes to the, uh, the deterrence of, of, of elections, which is doing a fraud risk assessment. We think this should be pre pretty standard, because how can we possibly find 
countermeasures if we don't really know what are the fraud risks and the risks of malpractice in the system that we're about to, uh, to uh, organize. Um, but once you have done an assessment, you also need to figure out what are the countermeasures we need to develop for, for, for this. But I think one telling factor when you walk into an EMB and its headquarters, how serious it is when it comes to combating fraud is, do they actually have an officer that's responsible for these kind of things? An extremely few number of EMBs even have an office, an officer that's supposed to be looking after this. And if you don't have someone that has this responsibility for this, there will not be a systemic attempt to identify it, come up with solutions, and then based on these solutions, develop policies, regulations, and training programs. And another extremely important part that we seen in, 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 in Afghanistan, which is main weakness, is that you do not screen your staff. The biggest problems that the insurance industry is facing when it comes to uh, fraud is insider job because they know the the tricks, the uh, the uh, mechanisms they put in place in order to identify fraud. And if you don't have any any form of screening when it comes to the the people you actually staff, then you might have a huge problem on your hand. But how do we then learn that there is a fraud problem? in our electoral process. If you look again at the seed or the insurance industry, there are a couple of channels of information that seems to be much more effective than, than, in, uh, than, than uh, others. One is desk officers, your officers in the field, and the, the, the policies that you put in place. Um, so very much the first line of defense if for identifying fraud in regulators is your own staff. In the few places we've seen that are trying to combat fraud, EMBs tend to focus only on its headquarters, in its secretariat, and almost exclusively, uh, almost always forget <coughs> about the field structure. And that's really where you have an ability to pick up on these things. But they will only be able to pick up on fraud and irregularities if they know what you mean by fraud, what are the principles, the, the, the policies and how do I report it back into the headquarters. And it's amazing that in so many of these cases, in, in these places, there's no protocols for if someone is reporting a fraud case, what do we do with it? Who's supposed to be taking care of it? And what are the actions that needs to take, be taken in order to properly investigate it? And in the number of, of, of cases where we've seen, uh, since I don't have any principles or guidelines, there's a lot of selectiveness, randomness in how they deal with cases. And if you start applying that kind of a principle in your uh, adjudication process, then you're wide open for abuse, sorry, for, for uh, criticism or political biasness and, and abuse. So, what we're doing right now, it is to trying to refine on the, on the fraud risk assessment methodology that uh, was presented just now by, by uh, Chad Vickery, trying to make it as applicable as possible. We're trying to be a bit more frank in our discussions with not just donors, but with the EMBs that we do work with, that this is an important tool that need to be introduced, if not the running huge risks of uh, being responsible for fraudulent elections and thereby a, a, uh, some, uh, sometimes a, a nasty event. But I think I'm uh, over the time now, so thank you very much.